uh, paper I'm going to read to you that is a uh, more or less a gay affirmative, edging towards a gay-centered understanding or way of looking at, from a Jungian point of view, this old novel, Frankenstein. Okay, and uh, well, it might not seem connected on the surface how it could be that um, uh, someone could write such a story back then that somehow might be connected with this idea of becoming more self-reflective. Okay, but if you actually read this damn novel, it's an old, creaky old thing, okay, and I think there actually exists some different versions on top of it, by the way, if you're not particularly familiar with it. It's not just a version of Frankenstein. There are different, turns out, historically speaking, the way it was put together and so on, manipulated even over time, there are different editions even of it uh, that I might get to touch on here a little bit. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, if we go back kind of where, where it's been engendered, uh, it's, this is not coincidental with the fact that the folks of this scene are often involved in what today, not back then, but today we call alternate sexualities. But yet, it, this is going on in a time and place in which the overall general society, I don't know how much this might remind you of t today or not, but overall general society was absolutely opposed to that. It was abhorrent to the general society, if anything should become known on these kind of levels, vis-a-vis uh, -vis these private parties that were involved in the scene from which the novel Frankenstein develops. Or historically develops, historically from which the novel comes. That's not maybe generally known now. It's a, we're certainly not wanting to be known generally back then. <laughs> so you get these typical ways of looking at the story. For example, since it's become well known in, in Western influenced cultures, the story of Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenstein is well known. Uh, you get these typical stories that, well, what it's really about is science run amok, for example, or uh, uh, people can't handle what they unleash, or, or you sure get what you ask for. <laughs> it's certainly been portrayed that way a lot. <laughs> however, however, if you go back again to the early, early kind of versions and sensibility of what is being discussed in it, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't, so not, not like that really, it's not, that does not seem really to be more so realistically the central theme of the novel, what the novel's really about, uh, uh, though it's a, it's a kind of mixed bag in a way, again, for those of you who may not be familiar with it itself, it's kind of episodic in a certain way, but it has an overarching theme also, of course, uh, which is what makes it really interesting, is where it uh, takes the story. But if you look into uh, the particulars of poor little Dr. Frankenstein, why does he get itself into trouble? He's seeking knowledge. He's seeking better knowledge. He wants more understanding of, I don't know, what, what back then might have been called the mysterious. Uh, you know, that some, perhaps science hadn't evolved enough. Uh, when Mirachelle was thinking of the idea of applying electricity to this the, in, uh, animation of this mystery, uh, it's still maybe a historical time when um, science has just begun to, so to speak, take over from the job of religion. Mm -hmm. This would be the mass society, so it's a kind of, what might we mean by gothic in a way, perhaps. It's this kind of sensibility that shows up in the novel like that, in that kind of way. But nonetheless, if you look under that, kind of suggested one looks under that level about what Dr. Frankenstein's interest is in. Historically, not necessarily what we define as homosexual now, okay, but historically that's what homosexuality is associated with. In most other historical times and places when this association was common, that was not highlighted or pointed out because of its very commonness. It was not thought to be in, in anything worth noting. <coughs> It's actually only in the last uh, several hundred years of which stories like Frankenstein are played a part in this very theme uh, that uh, homosexuality per se becomes itself noted more and more. So, but not by itself, not as behavior, in conjunction with identity, in conjunction with not only identity, but what uh, in the more modern sense might be meant by the idea of uh, being a person, a person who's, I don't know what to describe as 
rise of the notion of the person. Earlier on, it was not common, though. We just tend to project back on the past or other times and places that what we uh, take as, quote, the, a person is not so generically. Uh, and the sense of being an individual that has an individual source of truth, for example, politically, that's, that's very unique to this kind of evolutionary de historical development I'm naming here. It's not true of uh, other cultures unless, uh, like uh, I'm, I'm sure many of the folks sitting here, if not all of us, are uh, rather queer, and uh, that would also often designate us from very early on to be noticed if you're in small groups, or early kinds of forms of human social life. <coughs> I would suggest this would be noted early on, how, how uh, anyone who's truly, by queer I mean particularly, not just different sexually, uh, but where there's a particular uh, uh, genitally developable interest in same-sex interest in particular. That whatever that gets named or labeled, uh, I'm talking about how it gets associated with things that are not look like they're sexual. Like when I'm talking about self-reflection, self-awareness, self-waking up, I'm saying they're not so um, obscure as all of this might seem. As I'm uh, tending to first use words to describe these associations. So uh, early on, people could see it was not it's not ar arcane the way I'm. Might, might seem now from how I'm describing these connections between things, that if a person was weird, let's call it, or as a young child seemed weird on the basis or virtue of uh, interest in um, <coughs> things that were considered typical of someone who had a more um, spiritual bent, let's call it, um, um, the odds were very, very good, though not perfect, but very good that they also had a, some kind of queer sexuality. I mean, at least kind of fluid or bisexual, if not outright uh, homosexual orientation, uh, which is uh, very common. Uh, so uh, we know the products, uh, us sitting here, are the products of easily a thousand years of, of trying to weed this out of humanity on the part of a large part of humanity, at least. Uh, and uh, not, not mentioning the rank homophobic of, of homophobia of other cultures, <laughs> besides the Western tradition here, even. <laughs> in terms of uh, uh, this uh, problem that uh, strikes me as quite typical all over, all over the world in terms of the valuation of homosexual uh, experience, uh, of uh, same-sex love, and I mean that in the sense of as that uh, is something indigenous, experienced as indigenous, uh, in terms of the, the, the experience of the desire of it comes to one who wants to grow in one, wants to uh, uh, be enabled through, through one's partnership with it and helps to, to grow uh, 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 actualities that uh, express that, that confirm that, that fulfill that, bring satisfaction and fulfillment. Not necessarily does it have to lead to what we call a sense of personal identity based on this kind of uh, erotic motivation, uh, but uh, one can see that um, if there is an interest in um, uh, sense of self, uh, if we now extend the idea of self to interpersonal relations and we're going to be adult about it, it's got to be mutual, it's going to be a sense of mutuality that must be true for the other party as well. The other party as well must be uh, also interested in becoming a more true group themselves also. Um, so we have very interesting interpersonal possibilities as well. That's here I'm suggesting to you the idea that when we're attracted in the same sex way, okay, uh, our self vis-a-vis the, the self of the partner is implicated and involved in a related way that um, uh, um, uh, unlike when, we take, when we're uh, the different sexes, we appear as the other, a strange other. Uh, this is like the opposite kind of, it has its own shadow, so I want to make it sound glorious and like it's the be all and end all of anything, but as just a way that things are. Uh, when this is the configuration around this amorousness by which I mean our human desire to have genital sexual satisfaction, which is more than a mere level where the animals, we have that level where, like the animals that want to have that, that be pure f physical experience, uh, but also we want to have it as human beings, depending on how we feel what that means and what that amounts to, what one's experience of oneself. Uh, and here I'm talking about a form of desire that 
uh, uh, through experiencing it with another, or ultimately thus with oneself, uh, uh, becomes uh, or wants to encourage a kind of engine of developing who one is looking at versus how who is is being seen. So both get to grow. Ultimately, it's about how I, uh, Carl Jung talks about the idea of a man and God grow together, so to speak. Um, sound sexist about it in terms of what you might be referencing. Uh, but the idea that the divine and human have an intimate interest uh, in developing this kind of sensibility. Uh, and I'm, I'm suggesting that um, uh, um, a same sex vibration, let's call it uh, gentle vibration as we would experience it in the body, uh, is a body level of trying to teach us to appreciate that get a better handle on that if we can. You know, in, in, in other times and places besides the last thousand years of great war or decimation, there would have been some kind of traditions. And one would not have just merely, in my opinion, usually grown up all alone with the feeling of being all alone and the feeling that <clears throat> one's queerness was some kind of uh, oddly isolated thing. Uh, 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 this is part of our atomization and great stigmatization unique kind of stigmatization put on being homosexual. Uh, though that extends to the control, of course, of sexuality and all kinds of strong rights in addition to uh, uh, what I would consider the most important things to make sure one is taking a condemnatory stance towards this same-sex love if one wants to empower a heterosexual ideology. The heterosexual uh, way of mentality is, a, is an integral component of way that I'm just power, I might call it just power, the power system works, then uh, it's going to have a vested interest in making sure that any competing way, and I'm talking this is the way that is most so that way, not by virtue of an interest in being competition to uh, quote normal love, let's call it breeding, the love that creates literal children, but rather because of these um, tonal qualities I'm naming. Most cultures, uh, uh, most cultures have been more so been able to appreciate this tonal difference by same-sex desire to uh, be able to have some respect or honor for it, if not better than that. Uh, there are certainly remarkable historical examples we can all think of uh, where uh, such forms of same-sex sexuality were, were given uh, a certain uh, kind of uh, front respect, always within a system of, of the culture but certainly by the time of, for example, this novel of Frankenstein, uh, poor homosexual folks were in a terrible place, an awful, terrible place, okay? Uh, and uh, uh, while it might seem obvious uh, to suggest the idea now uh, that the novel of Frankenstein, which is you know about this man who creates an artificial man, a doctor creates this artificially living man, uh, who then goes around trying to, the creature, which is only called the creature throughout, uh, tries to destroy this man's life and in revenge, in terrible revenge. What, what is it, why, how could it, this man search for knowing to birth this creature that would now seek terrible revenge on him? Well, that's supposed to be the title of, of the paper that I wrote. The problem of the novel Frankenstein, the problem of Dr. Frankenstein. Dr. Frankenstein had a problem, he had a big problem. Picture if you were a gay man, and I don't, when I'm talking, you just want to suck dick, you know, in the bathrooms. That was fine, and no problems with that. I'm talking, you want to live that way, you want to be that way, you want to have that kind of identity and stuff. And this is back, you know, like 1800, 1810, you know, <coughs> in like such a monstrously straight jacket in places. London, if you can picture it. <laughs> How awful that would be. You certainly might want to flee to Italy as uh, Mary Shelley's husband, uh, Percy Bish, uh, uh, fled often to uh, Italy uh, to uh, try and escape such a horrifying uh, uh, pressure of conformity. Uh, this uh, amazing quality of uh, no matter what you really were, you had to certainly put on the show you have to at least make the occurrences, and believe it or not, that's what these hardcore romantics were, these kind of rebels of the day. Uh, and they didn't um, uh, merely want to submit to that. Of course, in our terms, we might see them now as rather ambivalent. 